Hey everyone, welcome to the chapter two, Chemistry of Life Notes, part three, lipids. Lipids are hydrocarbons composed of carbon and hydrogen atoms. They are insoluble in water because of the many nonpolar covalent bonds. This means they are going to shy away from polar substances. So when lipids are close together, they will kind of huddle together and form weak interactions. These are not true bonds. These are just interactions because they happen to have the same type of charge, which is no charge at all. We refer to these as van der Waals interactions. This has a very important implication for biological organisms because cells are mostly composed of water. And since water, from what we learned earlier, is polar, this means that lipids, nonpolar substances, do not interact with water. So we call them hydrophobic. So we're going to review the basic information of those macromolecules as they pertain to lipids, just like we did in the previous video. So in this first row, what you're going to do, this row represents the chemical makeup of the macromolecules. Circle or highlight the row or the, the, the cell that pertains to lipids for chemical makeup. The cell that you should have circled or highlighted is CHO because lipids are made of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen, but not in a one-to-one -one ratio. In the next row, you are given examples of the macromolecules. Circle or highlight the examples of lipids. The box you should have circled or highlighted is this one, because fats, oils, cholesterol, and hormones are examples of lipids. In the next row, you're going to, you are given the types of bonds that hold the macromolecules together. Circle or highlight the type of bond that pertains to lipids. The box you should have circled or highlighted is the next row pertains to the function of the macromolecules. Circle or highlight the function of lipids. The box you should have circled or highlighted is this one, because the function of lipids is long-term energy and they are chemical messengers as well. In the last row, circle or highlight the box that represents the monomers for lipids. The box you should have circled or highlighted is triglycerides. Although triglycerides are not truly the monomer of lipids, there are enough polymers of lipids that are made of triglycerides that we're going to call this the, the monomer. Please note we're going to talk about some examples of how some lipids don't actually have triglycerides as their monomer. So the structure of that triglyceride is that it's made of three fatty acids. And in the name triglycerides, it gives you that hint. Tri means three. These fatty acids are nonpolar hydrocarbon chains attached to a polar carboxyl group, known as carboxylic acid. You have one glycerol, which kind of acts as the backbone, and glycerol is an alcohol with three hydroxyl groups. And so the synthesis of a triglyceride triglyceride would involve three condensation reactions. You don't really need to know the structure of the triglyceride, so we are going to draw it in a very generic form. And this is what it would look like. This would be the fatty acids that are coming off of that glycerol backbone. Like we did with carbohydrates, we're gonna talk about how structure affects functions in the lipids. And I'm going to start by explaining example number one. And to do that, I'm going to show you some pictures and show you how to draw a simplified version of this example. So in the first example, example number one is going to be saturated fats versus unsaturated fats. 
In the second example, we're going to talk about the structure of phospholipids. First, let's talk about the saturated versus unsaturated fats. Now, when we're looking at these, the terms saturated and unsaturated are referring to the number of hydrogens that are present in the carbon-hydrogen chain. And this is going to be influenced by the, the valence electrons of carbon. Remember that your valence electrons are the electrons that are actually available for pairing. And we need to remember that carbon can form four bonds. However, carbon is unique or one of the unique elements that can form double or even triple bonds. And that's going to affect the saturation of the fat. So on the left here, we have a very generic chain. They show it as a zigzag, but I'm going to show you how to draw it much more simplified of a series of carbons and hydrogens um, bound together and they are all single bonded. That means that when I draw a carbon chain, let's say of four carbons, around each of the carbons, I can fit hydrogens. So for example, I can fit in this carbon right here, there's already one bond, two bonds around this carbon. So I can add up to two more hydrogens, which I will do now. And so you can see this carbon now has the four bonds, one, two, three, four. And I can continue doing so for the rest of this chain. When I get to this last carbon though, since it only has one bond here, I can add three hydrogens. And that is what it would look like. Now this is what's known as a saturated fat. And the saturated fat, as you can see, has a series of four carbons and one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine hydrogens around this carbon chain. Now let's take a look at unsaturated fats. With unsaturated fats, there will be a double bond. And so you can see in the illustration here that the double bonds, these ones are highlighted in yellow, but we're gonna draw a simplified form using the same number of carbons. So here's my four carbon chain, but now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna add a double bond between two of the carbons. So when I go in to fill out the rest of my hydrogens, you can see here that I'd be able to form here, this carbon right here has one, two bonds, so I can add two more hydrogens. However, the next carbon, this one right here, has one, two, three bonds already. So I can only add one more hydrogen to this carbon. And now it's got four bonds, one, two, three, four. The same thing's gonna happen to this carbon right here. One, two, three bonds already. So now I've added a fourth bond, a fourth hydrogen. So one, two, three, four. Now in reality, I could have simply added this hydrogen to the other side like this. And the number of hydrogens doesn't change but the structure of it does change. And so that also plays a role in how this uh, molecule is going to behave. If the hydrogen is on opposite sides of the double bonds, if the hydrogens are on opposite sides of the double bond, for example, this one is here, whereas this one is here, on opposite sides, this is referred to as trans fats. If the hydrogens are on the same side, like I originally showed, this is referred to as cis fats because the hydrogens are on the same side of this double bond. Filling out the rest of this molecule, this last carbon still only has one bond, so that means I could form three hydrogen bonds here. Now let's count up the carbons, the, the, the carbon hydrogens in this fatty acid chain. Remember that we did that for saturated fats. And we had a C4H9 formula for this fat, fatty acid chain. In this molecule over here, we still have four carbons. 
But now when I add up the number of hydrogens, we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven hydrogens now. And so you can see that this molecule, the this with the double bond, has less hydrogen than this one does. Seven is less than nine. So this is what is referred to as an unsaturated fat. Whereas the one that contains the maximum number of hydrogens is referred to as a saturated fat. And this is going to play a role in the structure and I'm sorry, the struct, the change in the structure changes the function of these fats. Your typical saturated fats are the ones that are going to be solid at room temperature. So think of butter or baking grease. Your unsaturated fats are going to be liquid at room temperature. So these are going to be more your oils like corn oil or olive oil. Now the reason the unsaturated fats remain liquid at room temperature has to do with that double bond. So if you can imagine this molecule here, this is my carbon chain, that double bond causes a kink in the chain here. So you can see for the saturated, they are, are very much long straight chains. But with your unsaturated, what happens is these kinks push the molecules apart and cause more spacing in between. And so there's looser interaction. And so it remains at a liquid stage rather than packing close together the way solids would. In the next example of how structure affects function, we're going to talk about phospholipids, which you may remember from ninth grade. So before we do that, there's a term I need to introduce to you, which is amphipa amphipathic. Amphipathic molecules have both hydrophilic ends and hydrophobic sides to them. And the phospholipid is a classic example. Phospholipids are two fatty acids and a phosphate compound bound to that glycerol. The phosphate group has a negative charge, making that, that part of the molecule hydrophilic. So you, remember, you may remember this drawing, where this was referred to as the head, and these were referred to as the tails. So a phospholipid has both a hydrophobic and hydrophilic portion, or you could also say that the phospholipid has a polar section and non-polar section to it. Here's a detailed image of what the phospholipid would look like, although you don't need to know the details about the chemical structure. There are some key things I want to point out. First of all, this portion up here, all of this is what you refer to as the phospholipid head. And keep in mind that the phospholipid head is the polar region. So in here, there would be a phosphate group, one of the functional groups we talked about at the, at the beginning of the notes on carbohydrates. And there are some other molecules as well, the glycerol backbone, your alcohol, but we're just going to simply refer to this region right here as the polar head. Your non-polar region is the tails. And it's those non-polar tails that are going to interact with each other in aqueous solution, in other words, in water. And this is very helpful because it'll form what is known as the phospholipid bilayer. So the hydrophobic tails, which you can see here, interact with other hydrophobic tails because they want to avoid the outside and inside environment of the cell, which is mostly water. The heads of these phospholipid molecules don't mind interacting with this water. And so it's thanks to this structure that we have a semi-permeable membrane. So any substance that is polar, let's say um, you have a, an ion of some kind, and the ion is polar, I know this because it's got a charge, if it attempts to cross the membrane, it would have no problem interacting with the head region, but this hydrophobic area would repel it, so it is not allowed to cross through the membrane. Small substances that are nonpolar, such as hormones and cholesterol, are going to be able to integrate or pass through the hydrophobic tails. But we'll get into details about that when we do the unit on membranes. 
So in summary, we looked at how saturated versus unsaturated fat um, are an example of structure affecting function. Now down below in the description box, we have a great short little video that explains the saturated versus unsaturated. And it also goes into detail about how that affects human health. And so I, really, I strongly recommend you watch that video. We also used phospholipids an example, as an example of how structure affects function in the lipids. We talked about how phospholipids are, or the uh, phospholipids are amphipathic, having polar or water loving water interacting parts, hydrophilic, um, and they also have nonpolar areas. And those tails, that nonpolar areas, are what we, we refer to as hydrophobic. We also have another video on this very, very short video on the structure of the phospholipids linked in the description box below and hope that they help to clarify what these structures look like. Thanks so much for watching, y'all. See you next time.